famed author Clive Cussler. The hero Dirk Pitt. Quail took a healthy belt of the scotch and shrugged. Do you think the Russians would hesitate to put us where it hurts? Quail finished his drink and gazed longingly at the bottle. They fired a torpedo at us. Night Probe Episode 4 Smoking While Doing a Cigar Podcat! Hi, Podcat! I sat down so the cat is here. And it's just going to go back and forth until she figures out how to fuck with my keyboard. Oh, well, naturally, she's a cat. What's the cat's name? Lily. You going to stay there? Okay. All right, I don't have my new mic. How is your new mic? I think my new mic is good because I have really big lines on the thing going across the bottom of the screen. That's never you happened do. before. I can't wait. How much does it weigh? Does it feel gratifying? It weighs like three pounds. It's like cast iron. Because I had the other road one weighed a ton, the one that I had to return. Mm-hmm. And nobody has the USB one. Everyone says they have one in stock. No, they don't. So Amazon's coming. Amazon has to come through. I can't wait. It's coming. The exact one. The exact one. I can't wait. Look at your lines. Holy cow. I know. I am so jealous right now. (laughs) And that's rather nice, too. I'm not a pale ale person, but I had to try the Sasquatch pale ale. Oh, it's the Sasquatch. You gotta. I gotta. They went to the trouble of printing all those letters on a can. That is... That is an exciting font experiment they did there, getting that all on. It's not even two lines. It's one line all around the can. With a giant Sasquatch foot on it, because it's important that your beer remind you of feet. Yes. So you think of Jesus, and then that makes it okay, because it's in the Bible. I make that connection because there was the Super Bowl last week, and apparently there's some weird AI Jesus commercials. I didn't see it. I didn't see any part. Oh, God, I heard so much about that. (laughs) And people were washing feet, as you do, because of Jesus. And that is in the Bible, all up and down, and the women dried feet with their hair, which really freaked me out as a kid. No, I'm not doing that to anybody. That was a very biblical standard kind of role of supplication. Yeah, I think that is a level of trad wife I'm not comfortable with. Oh, I don't even like you saying trad wife. I was going to say, I don't think I'm I'm comfortable with any of those levels, but that one in particular seems (laughs) off. Hearing a man say trad wife, like, don't do that. (laughs) It wasn't in a complimentary way. Or no, it wasn't, but it's just weird. How have you been? Anything new? (laughs) No, there's never anything new. Listeners, the cat is taking over the podcast. If this cat could talk. The cat is climbing me. The way no animal wants more attention than when you're busy. Yep. Oh, I saw the rest of the show, The Night Agent. Ah. Uh-huh. And it was fascinating in terms of budget, because you could tell they had enough budget for five episodes, but they went to <laughs> ten. Oh, God, I love those. But there was a real dip in quality. Like, we went from, like, um, do you remember 24 with Kiefer Sutherland? Yep. So, like, that kind of heart-pounding action and cinematography. And then it nosedives into Rock Monster from the Sci-Fi Channel, and it, it was just brilliant. I loved it. I don't even know what show it was, but I watched a bunch of it when I was down visiting my parents last year. And maybe it's one of the NCIS's. Honestly, I couldn't tell. Like, But 95% of the episode was just people standing in different locations having conversations on cell phones. And 5% was like action. I'm assuming that they filmed that show for $10 because all we have to do is like stand on the (laughs) sidewalk here and like spin the camera around and talk on a cell phone. That's the show. I believe they got that from the CSIs. That I might have been a CSI. The rubric of, we're just going to have, oh, what's his name with the red hair? CSI Miami. David Caruso. Yes. Hey, fuck you. Who looks like he's been pre-embalmed. <laughs> and I think that's handsome, so I'm not criticizing it. I, I think he's a handsome guy, but he, he's not for everybody, and I get that. It was the, just him taking off his glasses and talking on his cell phone. And the, the song. That was it. Millions of dollars. People made millions of dollars off of that. Somehow, all of those shows about crime, Law and Order at least, you know, had and still has the walk and talk, but all those other ones, they just, they film for as cheap as they can, just so they can get to 100 episodes and get syndicated. I don't blame anybody for grabbing that bag. 
and the checks come rolling in. <laughs> There's NCIS Sydney, as in Sydney, Australia. Yeah, I saw that. Why? What do, do they call their Navy? Is it Australians populating that show, or is it Americans in Australia? Like fish out of water, we're taking over your country now? We've got a... I don't know. Special agents from NCIS, who I guess are loaned to the Australian Federal Police. Listeners, I've just done our entire world a disservice. I've made a man who built <laughs> bridges for a living waste time <laughs> on NCI Sydney. I am also the kind of personality who you raised a question and I had to have an answer or it would drive me insane. I I understand. I fully understand. But nothing else happened in my... Some people take cosplaying too far. My husband and I were shopping at a grocery store because he was off and there was this very tall white guy with like um, a Vietnamese style hat, like it, a wicker basket, but downward facing. Yeah. And a Nehru get up, like a Nehru dress that was teal. Hmm. So I'm guessing he's some kind of character, but he was very tall and imposing and skinny as a rail, like a death eater. <laughs> so just a wraith shopping with us. And he was paced, you know, like when you should arrive at the store at the same time as someone else, you kind of paced with them. Mm hmm. And my husband's like, is shopping always like this? Are these people, is this every day, is their costumes? <laughs> is your husband shocked by the act of going shopping for groceries? He's very bad at it. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> he's exceptionally bad. The last time, one of the few times I went shopping with him without children, we just got cookies and fireworks. Sweet. It was. It really was great, but it was like... That's the best trip. It's shopping cart of sin and bad decisions. Yes, me and my wife talk often about how we should probably eat something before we go shopping. If you're not hungry, how do you pick anything then? If I'm not hungry, I can't shop. I won't have any ideas. I won't come home with anything. Well, if I'm not hungry, I know what the essentials are that'll make the kids stop yelling at me. But if I go shopping when I'm hungry, we get 14 kinds of cheese. Oh, okay. I, I get that. I almost had fondue again before we started. And I was like, no, fondue is not a good <laughs> pre-show snack. Now you need a nap. Oh, is it my turn to do the to do the thing? It's all right. Hi, everyone. I am Nancy. Over there is co-host Topper. And this is Custler Hustlers, the only podcast that covers Dirk Pitt and anything Clive Custler. You can fact check us, but I'd advise against it. I've looked around. I haven't seen one yet. Hello, everyone. I think we're still number one. Yes, we are. And number 19 in New Zealand. You crazy bastard. <laughs> number 19 in New Zealand. Figure that one out. <laughs> I'm hoping we'll get a bit farther this episode than we have the last couple, because it took us three episodes to get through part one. <laughs> I have a tangent already. I was with working with a guy <laughs> once. <laughs> I'm sorry. I need a I bell hate... that goes off in the corner every time we start a new tangent. <laughs> I'm going to start was... adding that. It was just a three-day job on a television show. I was like getting coffee. I was a grunt. Nothing like, nothing big. But another grunt, same level of expertise, also getting coffee, was from Europe. And he did techno music. He made electronica music, which I find intolerable. But he was huge at it. And he got an email while he was working for like $6 an hour. He's like, I'm, I've got the number one song in Germany at the moment. And we looked it up and he did. Sweet. And we're like, great. Do you get money? No, <laughs> <laughs> I'll get a little probably. Tangent over, but I knew a rock star. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Part two, which we're just about to start, is a very short part, and I'm pretty sure we can get through all of part two and get into part three today. Because if I absolutely had to, I could sum up part two in like three sentences, but I figured we'll go in then a bit more detail than that. Oh yes, we just left Henry Villain or Henri Villon, depending on how fancy you feel. He he blinked out. The electricity for the U.S. for five seconds. Just a warning. Just a warning and really just a light flickering. Phrasing! Is it noticeable? To the authorities, yes, I assume. I would have to assume so. I guess hospitals have backup power. Lots of places have backup power. Sure, and lots of places have intermittent power. That just, oh, the lights blinked. Because infrastructure. They keep promising an infrastructure week. We never get one. Infrastructure bills are communism, though. Right. That's what they, that's what they keep saying. It was book two or book three, like it was either Iceberg or Titanic, where there was huge opposition to the president's jobs bill or something. That was the big issue in politics at the time. It's like spending on jobs. Oh, well, to be fair, we're terrible at that. We try and make 
uh, coal miners, oh, you can go code, as if that's the same personality and mental disposition, coal miner, coder. And as if there are that many jobs for coding in, you know, North Dakota. It was a real, um, as far as democratic messaging, a real loss. <laughs> I sometimes feel like the, the, the people that consult for the Democratic Party make the most money if the Democrats just lose, just, just by this much. Yeah, probably. So they're always given, there's a whole consultant class, I'm, in my mind, that I imagine, just like, no, no, we can't have them win, we'll lose money. <laughs> I assume that the consultant class is a subset of the lobbyists. Yeah, the people, you got to pay somebody to make your commercials and advise you on your campaign strategy. Those are jobs. There's also, my friend got a job, she's found it, as a fabric coordinator. Everyone, listen, there's a thing you can do. People who work at McDonald's or clean rooms or do really hard jobs make no money. This lady is now a fabrics coordinator, my friend, and she's making a ridiculous salary. Just ridiculous to coordinate pillows and blankets across the states for a person. You just have to find the right niche of consulting. That, there's, there's every type of consulting out there. I didn't know there was a bedding consulting or a fabrics consultant. And, it, and you can make up mid six figures. Jesus, I'm in the wrong business. I am in the, it is, you are at the mercy of some um, mercurial people that are very odd. Oh, yeah. Because if you're hiring one of those, <laughs> you're going to be a weirdo. That was three, maybe four tangents. So I got to keep track so I can put the bell in. We should start on chapter 21 and presidential security advisor, uh, Alan Mercier, is just worried because the president wants to declare bankruptcy. And he was like, the US is going to fall apart. This is going to be a catastrophe. It's, you can't declare bankruptcy and state president. That's not going to work. I declare bankruptcy. Yeah, he's panicking because this is grounds for impeachment and it's happening under his watch. And he finds out about this doodlebug project and it sounds like a boondoggle. In the 80s, in the Ross Perot years, Ross Perot was a political candidate who ran for president. Oh, it might have been the 90s, but he brought up the government is spending $20,000 on a hammer, $17,000 on a toilet seat. <laughs> What is going on? Even though this was the future for Clive, he did nail it perfectly. There was going to be a focus on government spending and the absurdities of it. There was going to be an outcry because it's either part one or not part one, episode one or episode two, he talked about how the, the doodlebug was $680 million that mysteriously went missing. You'd think if the United States is about to fall apart and impeach the president, that wouldn't matter, but he seems really into this gizmo. So he, he drops everything. Yes. And I think it's adorable because the person who has the debt or the person that loaned out the money, the one that is the most vulnerable is the one that loaned out the money. So if the United States is in debt, I've never, it's the person that gave you the money that's at, at leverage. You're not going to default. China, England, what, where, wherever we were borrowing money from at this time, and we were always worried about the national deficit. There's no reason it just can't go up. Is it good economics? Is it good money theory? No, but it's all an imaginary theory anyway. I spent my whole childhood hearing about the debt and the deficit and how it keeps going up and keeps going up and keeps going up. And now I'm in my mid forties and the debt and the deficit keeps going up and keeps going up. And I'm like, should anyone care? It's all just imaginary numbers in a page anyway. And it, it doesn't seem like anybody's putting like, there's no consequences to any of this. You know what I'm getting real sick of is them talking about the deficit. Oh, we're going to have to tighten our belts and pay that deficit. You know, we, your government misspent you, your hard-earned tax money, so you're going to have to tighten your belt. There really just is theories of money, and I've heard meetings with my husband and stuff where there, where there are people talking about like the esoterics and its impacts on society, and you're like, well, dude, just stop overdraft fees. <laughs> you don't have to have these high-level banking, banking conversations because it makes me frankly worried that people are making philosophical decisions about monetary problems and procedures instead of just like practical ones we know basic math let's keep it tactile over jeffies that's called what again class communism that's right feed poor people communism eliminate or do away with other banking fees communism but how will we pay for it communism but no there's the concept of should the poor also be crying 
<laughs> should the poor get a minimum wage or should we just give them a stipend because we know this they can live off of this number? Well, you see, they chose to be poor and in freedom in America, <laughs> I called your country freedom. In America, it's all about freedom of choice. Yes. And if anybody's where they are, it's because they chose to be. Something, something, personal responsibility. We're all free to die of the cold in the street. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, I can't remember who was off the top of my head, but it's talking about how the law in its exquisite fairness forbids both the rich and the poor to sleep under bridges, forbids the rich and the poor to both steal bread. It does, but... Yes. And also try to convey that level of... When we were children, I'm assuming you two, there was a very rosy view of law and order, and like, you do bad, you get punished. You do good, you get rewarded. Yeah, my dad was a cop. Yes, of course. And then you get older, and you're like, wow, if you just have money, you get rid of, you could do anything. What timeline, where do, what age do you tell that to your kid? Like, no, no, <laughs> this is the, when the rose-colored glasses come off. The cops might not help you. Oh, uh, my dad told me that, I think, when I was 10. Oh, double digits. That's good to know. <laughs> he was a cop, but he quit being a cop when I was like four or five, and he became a paramedic instead. And he never really got into why, but... The story I heard from a lot of other family members was he just became really disillusioned with being a cop and wanted a job where he could help people. I had that same epiphany, yes. <laughs> you think it's going to be one thing and it's not. It is. It's going to be a hero and then, no, we're just going to hassle people and write tickets. Yep. Anyway, if, this, if I ever get linked to this podcast in my hometown, I'm going to have my house set on fire. <laughs> You're a completely different Nancy. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know. We have... We have no crime and a bazillion cops, and they all just write tickets to maintain each other. But do the bugs. Yes. Mercier's flipping out over the deficit because he's quaint and provincial. He thinks his doodle bug is just another $50,000 hammer. So he's like, oh, I've got to track down this project. And he gets a call from Klein, his cohort that was looking into the doodle bug. At the DOE, the, the Department of Energy. Yes. And Klein's like, you gotta track down this guy Sandecker. It's not. This isn't under my jurisdiction. It's under this N U M A Numa something or other. And Sandecker hard to find. You'll never track him down. Hard to find and a hard ass. But Klein also says if if you can nail Sandecker to the wall, half of Washington will stand up and applaud you. Uh, a bit of fun, Clive has here. He says, "Good luck finding him." Basically, yeah, you're on your own. Meanwhile, next chapter, Sandecker. I was going to say, next chapter, he finds him. <laughs> hey, next, chap next chapter, we learn Sandecker jogs every day at 3.55 p.m. Impossible to find this guy. We get our standard Sandecker intro. He's 61 years old. He's bantam-sized, because they always describe he's, like, incredibly small but fierce. He's trim, fit, health nut, and he jogs with a cigar. Yeah. I love this man. I've never smoked a cigar. Both of my parents were four-pack-a-day smokers. So, eight-pack-a-day household? Whoosh. For Marble Red. Damn it, that pisses me off. I go through two lighters a day, dude. All right. Now I'm starting to feel it. So that put me off of the idea of smoking entirely. So I've never put a cigar anywhere near my face. Can you run and smoke a cigar? Have you ever touched a cigar? <laughs> if you're really good at it. You have the super villain look and, and a cat. You should have a cigar. <laughs> I have smoked a couple of cigars. I've never smoked regularly. I have smoked just because, like, I can. Because I knew how to do it without barfing. But, well, because my mom smoked the whole time growing up. And I was just really observant. I watched what people did when they smoked. You know, you don't go, <gasps> and suck it into your lungs. Okay, so you were just an observant, yeah. looking looking for what you can get away with. And that made you good at smoking the first time. You're good at everything. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> That's a damn lie, and you know it. Smoking while doing a cigar. Uh, smoking while doing a cigar. This guy is doing a cigar while he's jogging. <laughs> That's the name of the episode right there. <laughs> Freudian. Nothing. God damn. I always walk into that. Oh, I didn't mention the last episode. I ended up calling What's So Civil About War Anyway, just because it's all about Canada and the U.S. each devolving into their own civil wars. But I so wanted to use the quote that you came up with near the end, and I don't know if it's an insult you got from somewhere else, but you called Henri Vallon an encapsulate asshole, and I just loved that <laughs> that phrase. That's been in my uh, repertoire for years. But that would get blocked on all the podcast apps, so I that had to avoid it. That would not be 
be monetarily sane if if we ever try <laughs> to really monetize this. We, the the titles have to be uh, our very second episode was blocked on all the podcast apps until I went back and changed the title because it was also based on something you said, and that was smack sex. Long. That was what they were doing. Yeah. Oh, it, abs it absolutely was, but you can't have the word sex in a podcast title. These were slender people in the 80s. That means they, by today's standards, they were emaciated. They were Their bodies were making odd noises because they were dead. Because <laughs> they were on the beach. Yeah. Whereas I called one episode from Vixen 03 Syphilis Playground, and that was okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to know which words you can't use. Anyway, chapter 22, Mercier tracks down Sandecker. Yes. Oh, wait. Oh, no, not Sandecker. Not just yet. He, My bad. He tracks down Sandecker in chapter okay. 23. Chapter 22 is a whole lot of setup for what is just a video call. Yes, but he gets in the weeds because it's newfangled and futuristic. It's a video call in a projection room with a screen that takes up one entire wall. So this is like some secret spy shit. And also practical and easily obtainable. That's for secret spy stuff. You always want something that you need an entire wall for. No posters. Make sure it's blank. And the correct shade of white. He does play up the futuristicness of it. You know what? That's something our kids don't have. We used, When I was a kid, we used to think of all these gadgets we'd have in the future. Flying cars. Our kids don't have that. What a world. <laughs> hey, is test driving this doodlebug 3,000 miles away in the Labrador Sea? And this is the first time I've seen the word highfalutin printed out. Really? It is referred to as a highfalutin dowser. And I was like, oh, that's what you spell falutin. That's never come <laughs> up before. My mom loved that phrase. We have the quote for the episode where Sandecker asks Dirk how it's going, and Dirk says it's colder than a polar bear's rectum inside this floating abortion. Yeah. A magical way with words. Has Clive. I noted that too. A floating abortion. Grossa. How many wire hangers did they pack? <laughs> I have to bleep that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. They have this conversation. They, they talk about how they're thieves. They're avoiding detection. So you wonder just what horrible stuff they're up to, but it just turns out they're just in Canada. Yeah, they're just, they're almost Canada touching. They're like playing fast and loose with the border, but it, or is he all the way in Canada? Because it, it made it sound like he was dodging back and forth, like it was a wiggly. As we learn in what, like chapter 26 or whatever, they eventually deke into Canadian waters. So I think they were hanging out just outside Canadian waters, but they were still oh. like, it's a secret sub off the coast of, of North America. So you can imagine that would set off some alarm bells. And yes, yes, it does. Now chapter 23, Sendecker meets up with Mercier. Mercy's like, you got to come to Jesus with this doodlebug project. Mercy thinks he has this guy on the ropes. Sandecker, you've been spending this money, but you've got to account for it. You've got to show us if it's worth it, what this project's about. He's calling him on the carpet, sort of. He's telling him he's going to be called on the carpet, <laughs> giving him three days. And Sandecker's like, oh, I need like two weeks minimum. And they, they bargain down to one week. And Sandecker seems oddly happy with that. Yeah. And Mercier seems like, did I get played? Something is oddly <laughs> off about this. Because don't forget, Sandecker's the hard ass. Sandecker's the hard ass, and now he's the happy hard ass he won. What what he won, we're not yet sure of. But now we get chapter 24, which is like a mega chapter. This is half of my notes. And I wonder if the microphone is picking up my cat purring. So she's put her head right next to the microphone. I'll nope. find out when I do the mix. No. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, chapter 24. I just want to get one thing out of the way because it starts off with something I had to put in all caps and bold. Sandecker stressed out because of the whole project with the doodlebug. So after dinner at, at the Army and Navy Club, he pours himself a glass of buttermilk oh to unwind. First thing in my notes, a glass of buttermilk? <laughs> this is a psycho. Get him off the streets. He's heading an agency. He, did, he shouldn't drive a car. He jogs while smoking a cigar and drinks buttermilk to relax. Man is my hero. The men will have some interesting arterial uh, works. Even she's drinking plain milk. I haven't done that since, oh, high school. They, you get the little, we would get the little cartons of milk, and one of them was uh, turned. I got a whole mouthful of chunky milk, and that was the last time I drank milk. Oh, the cat's biting me. And no one likes chunky milk. Yeah, that's not good. No one likes chunky milk. I was 
and I hold the grudge. So my house on days when all the kids are home goes through about uh, one gallon a day. So my daughter's looking at me and making an angry face. <laughs> she nods and well, goes, "Yeah, we well, do." Whole milk or skim milk, like some hippies. Two percent. Oh, you dirty hippies! <laughs> yeah, yeah, granola too. How wholesome are you people? Now my wife is yelling, "It's homo milk." I <laughs> well, it, good. Homogenizing is good. Exactly. I am a firm believer in full fat, whatever product you're using. I've been on a tiramisu kick. Our house has consumed cauldrons of heavy cream, so I'm not like <laughs> against milk for its properties. I just remember the snack wells diet. The low fat diet craze of the nineties really has the scars I'm still dealing with apparently. It's oh like yeah. Like uh, emotional deep scars. Like for snack wells low fat. Rawr. My parents were on Weight Watchers, so for a while there most of our food came freeze dried in boxes. How exciting for you. Good times. It was more expensive, but at least it tasted bad. Yes. And there was so much less of it. <laughs> the worst macaroni and cheese on the planet. And that was milk talk. With Topper and Nancy. <laughs> He's drinking his buttermilk and he gets a phone call that they have a problem. Uh, there's an enemy sub and he storms out while wearing his slippers. Yes. And uh, back on board the Doodlebug, before they're under siege, Pitt and Quail, Pitt's on board the Doodlebug with a guy named Quail, found booze. Just a side note, always <laughs> important, Pitt found booze. And and then they're attacked by a sword. <laughs> Not just found booze. I think it was him and Quail who each talked about all the things they're not allowed to bring on board, and they each pull out their own booze. Yes. Now remember, we're not allowed to have this. You got it. Wink, Quail's wink. Quail's functioning alcoholic. Quail has... Pitt has to leave his bottle with Quail. Because <laughs> Trail takes three glasses immediately, and he's like, uh, can I hold on to the bottle? Because his bottle was already empty. Oh, I missed that. Jesus. But a, a heat-seeking torpedo is fired from the other submarine, the mystery submarine, which we quickly find out is a U.S. class submarine, uh, an Amberjack class submarine. Yeah, and they're like, at least it's friendly, and then it immediately fires on them because they are an unidentified sub. On on the border, this is sketchy territory. Yep. And maybe, Sandecker, this is why you coordinate between interagencies. But it was a secret. But... <laughs> If there's one thing I've learned from Behind the Bastards and Lions Led by Donkeys, is that when the agencies don't talk to each other, people die. <laughs> yeah. Every time. The CIA and the FBI arresting each other for the same crime. It's great. You got this this guy paid out there who's much less of a functioning alcoholic. He doesn't drink nearly as much as some of the people he's surrounded with. He, he's a guy that's never going to wait for backup. Oh, yeah. If you've learned anything from the last several books where he became world famous each time. Yeah, he doesn't wait for backup. That's not in his blood. And this is the guy who is in charge of world saving multiple times. Chapter 25. Oh, well, we're not there yet. We've got a lot more chapter 24 to go, in theory. Oh, I thought, you know, it's a lot of uh, torpedo talk and submarine maneuvering. Yeah, there's a lot of that. I do like that Dirk asks how deep they are, and one of the guys on the oodle box says 260 meters. And then there's just a whole aside about how much Dirk hates the metric system, but he does some quick math and he figures that 700 feet. He's been using meters for everything for the last four books, but now he hates the metric system. And I think he only hates the metric system because this book's about Canada. What an odd way to code patriotism. <laughs> Our system is better. But yeah, uh, they dodge a missile while Sendecker gets Admiral Kemper on the phone. And he has to get Kemper out of bed. Tells Kemper, you know, contact your sub. You're shooting at one of ours. And Kemper's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And there's a lot of back and forth. Sandecker had to yell at an underling who was like, I can't wake up the Secretary of the Navy. And Sandecker's like... <laughs> Just unloads on him. He will be a corporal in Siberia if you don't get him on the phone yesterday. I also love one of Kemper's quotes where he says, Sorry, Jim, the U.S. doesn't usually shoot first and ask questions later. I mean, Listeners, the look Nancy just gave the camera, I think sums that up pretty well. I stand in sarcasm and solidarity with you all <laughs> on that comment. That was 10 seconds of confused silence for me. <laughs> it wasn't confused, it outrage. No confusion, just this is the week, listeners, of uh, Acorn Cop. I don't know if you've seen that video. Hell yes. But there is a cop who opened fire into a police car that he was walking. He had a suspect. He arrested for something minor, like a shoplifting or jaywalking, something everyday petty. Shackled in the back of his car. He exits the vehicle. He's hit by an acorn. He thinks he's taking fire. Empties his round, empties his gun into the car. 
His partner, who was some ways away from a different angle, also empties her round into the car. Acorn guy gets hit by another acorn and thinks he's been hit, as in hit by a bullet. Shot. It's all deeply embarrassing. All right, everybody freeze. Don't move. We know you're invisible. But at least I saw this morning that he is resigning. Like, he's not going to be a uh, a cop in a new town. He's like, no, I'm done. Oh, good. I'm not sure he knows how to come back from this. Lives on in infamy on the internet for a long time. Because <laughs> shoot, we don't shoot first. Or, no, we always shoot first. <laughs> it's your specialty. And we're a deeply uncurious country. We never ask questions. We'll just shoot and never ask the questions. We're fine with that. The chapter ends with the missile hitting, and then one by one, all the computers in the control room that Sandecker's in go out. Yes. And everyone just naturally assumes the doodlebug is destroyed. Well, they also, there's a throwaway line. They call the shape of the doodlebug a diving deformity, which I thought was Oh, cute. yeah. Uh, it's shaped like a airplane wing, uh, vertical, and it has fins coming off the side. And I know I've seen, like, a spaceship like that in some kind of sci-fi show. It, it does sound... Like, yeah, it does sound familiar in that instance, but it would have been a bizarre, thin-shaped vessel for 1970-something and 1980-something. This Reminders, everyone, was written in the 70s and takes place in 1989. During what I assume was some kind of energy crisis. Yes, the gas shortages and the gas rationing. Chapter 25, Mercier is about to have a serious meeting with Sandecker. He, he does, he's not looking forward to it. He respects the man. There's been a tragedy. As far as he knows, Pitt... And the other people on board the Doodlebug have been killed. And now Sandecker has got a face comeuppance for this very expensive failure of a project. But Sandecker strolls in like he's going on a parade. He's wearing his gold braid even. Yep. He's going down swinging. And it's not just a meeting with him. It's a meeting with him, the president, the secretary of state, the DOE, the head of the CIA, and Admiral Kemper. And Sandecker walks in there knowing he owns the place. He's got info that's going to change the tone of everything he's not in trouble and he knows it i mean he probably thinks he's in trouble because yes this is the chapter where they explain the doodle bug and how it works and it's basically side scan sonar but in true science fiction fashion it can penetrate 10 miles of the earth's crust and it it's doing that to um detect minerals and metals and the clock zero and it was invented with funding from the previous president and meta section. So once again, a call back to the Titanic. Yes. The Kemper, the Secretary of the Union, how does this thing work? And very scientifically, helpfully, Sandecker's like, energy pulses. Energy pulses. Yeah. Clears it up. No notes. <laughs> we bounce a signal off the rocks, and the, the signal we get tells us what the rocks are, and what the rocks behind them are, and what the rocks behind them are. Ten miles? What? <laughs> Krypton do they have on board? Exactly. Like, it is basically mass spectrography. Mass spec spectography? Something like that. I don't know exactly where the R's are in that word. This is magical futuristic mass spectrography. It really is. It made me feel nostalgic for, for magical futuristic. Because, like <laughs> I said earlier, really not a tone or a vibe anymore. I really hope somebody at some point reverses the polarity of something just to make something happen. You got to do that. Oh, and across the streams while doing it. Oh, yeah. Definitely not. So while he's in this meeting, uh, Al sends him a note. It was Al, right? It was Al because there's this whole aside where Al is like sitting sadly in that control room and Dirk's secretary, Zeri Pachinski, who's back again from the previous book, comes in with a sandwich for Al and they talk about how great Dirk was in their childhood together and all that. And as these techs are taking all these computers apart... And as Al is, is about to drive her home, he sees one light turn on, and he freaks the fuck out. Yes, it, it, there was a flicker or something. As he's leaving the room, he sees something on the monitors that catches his eye. And he's, it's written like, he couldn't tell you what. So it's more like um, the psychic connection to Dirk Pitt that he so deeply feels mm -hmm. flickered on the screen. It manifested outside of his body, externally. His grief created this, this event. But it's harking back to the secretary... Uh, she's not 32. She's 30. Really? Dirk's secretary is Zeri? But she brings the sandwich and she's not even 32. What a woman. Oh, uh, yeah. Sand Sandecker called in Al to help rescue this mission. While Sandecker's in a meeting with the president and 
all the big wigs. He gets a note from Al. Pitt is alive. Pitt's alive. They're okay. The missile hit a rock, of course. Yes, the outcropping. So they were missed, but it messed up their comms for hours. And then they they had to dodge the uh, American submarine because they didn't know if they were going to get their asses shot up again. So while they were running away, they found a 95-mile-long oil field with 8 billion barrels of oil because the doodlebug also does rough calculations for what mineral it is, how much it'll cost to extract, and what the extents are. It's a magic submarine. It's a magic yellow submarine. Well, it's an app. They've got an app. Oh, good point. Okay. I bet it's AI enabled. I bet it is. I bet it toxic Knight Rider too. Sweet. 95 miles by three quarters of a mile wide. So it's just like a long runway of oil that they've detected under the sea. But where is this long runway of oil? Oh, it's Quebec touching. It is in Quebec. And I cannot believe the raw gravitas that the audiobook reader gives to the president saying, of all the places in the world, it had to be Quebec. As a Canadian, this is the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and that was all of part two, just... the doodlebug. Part two is over. We're into part three now. Is, is, is Quebec like that bar in the movie Roadhouse? But that's all Quebec, like a French roadhouse? <laughs> no, I don't think that they're like a micro state of a Russia loving commie badasses. Quebec is just like, it's a nice province. They're the province that gives us La Boheme, which is like the weirdest snowman mascot there is and where we get good baking from and poutine. They're not holding the world ransom with hydropower and oil. I, well, they may feel differently about that. You're not a Quebecistanian, so. <laughs> also a good word. Pitt arrives. Uh, he's back home. Oh, yeah. Part three, the North American Treaty, April. Yes. This chapter starts off with him flying home from Newfoundland after he got off the doodlebug. Then he gets into his, at the airport, he finds his 1966 Ford Cobra ready to go. And his secretary tells him, he left a note saying, I told Sandecker you'll be in tomorrow. So he's got a free day. He's off today, mm -hmm. and now his mind wanders to his secretary, <laughs> who's got fawn colored hair. I know I would love it if my husband, the love of my life, my rock, said, your hair looks like that animal, but no, no, the baby animal. <laughs> that eats our lawn. <laughs> yeah. You know all the trees we bought that got killed? Yeah. That's what your hair reminds me of. So romantic. Yeah. He spends a lot of time describing her uh, 30, hazel eyes, pretty, full-bodied. And talks about all the times he could have slept with her, but didn't. He's learned in his younger years, being the boss and sleeping with her staff is bad. Which is very woke for him. And I cannot believe that. This is almost hardcore feminist propaganda here. My God. For the time, don't sleep with your worker, your, your employees. I'm not employed. That's why you had employees. What are you talking about, man? But in spite of that, he does have an erotic fantasy while jamming the car into gear. So they had to remind you, he's still all man. N and no symbolism in, in relation to that. <laughs> None at all. But he's on his way. He's going to look for um, old man Essex. And he yep. runs into the town busybody, who he's not really nice to. He's cordial. But in his mind, he was like, oh, I ran into this town busybody. This broad's never going to shut up. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. she's dropping information on him that he needs. His house is over there, but you won't find him. Uh, he left four weeks ago. But he always leaves town this time of year. But for some reason, he didn't cancel his newspapers and the heat's still on. Oh, that, here's all the plot you missed, Dirk. <laughs> yeah. And instead of being, well, you know what? She's not 32. We're, we've established she's old, whoever this passerby lady is. And she didn't feed him at all. So we'll come to another lady he likes a lot more after she gives him pie. <laughs> so maybe it is. He only likes women 32 and under or holding food. Yep. This rando on the street who's nosy, not cool. No. Helpful, but not cool. So he learns yes. Essex is out of town. He still goes down to his house anyway, because what's some breaking and entering to Dirk Pitt? Exactly. Laws don't matter. He's doing good things. So he has to break the law for good things. But when I do it, it's cute. But first he examines Essex's cars and goes into some detail about how one of them is a Cadillac Brome, the last of the big cars. And it's meticulously clean. So immediately he knows this isn't the kind of person who would forget to cancel his newspapers. You can tell that from the car. Yes. And 
Well, another thing about the car made a note to do, 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 do secretary, irresponsible, busy button. Do, do, do. Those are the kinds of cars you take to like a stop sign, and it, by the time you can see the intersection, you're past the intersection. It's the biggest, most rectangular land yacht you can imagine. It's, if you hate aerodynamics. But it rides great, though. Who needs aerodynamics when you have fuel mileage this bad? <laughs> but he admires the cars, and then he realizes the front door is unlocked. Uh-oh. And I have a tangent. Ding. My best, my best friend growing up found her super. Her apartment building in Brooklyn, her mom would send her down. She was like nine or ten. You know, here's the envelope. Go give this to the super. First of the month, here's the rent. She found the super in the state. Whoa. And the state is to be, re be revealed now. Essex is dead. He's very, very dead. He was an old man. He lived alone. It happens. He's dead and he's been decomposing for a month in a room with the heat turned up. There's a lot of description here, folks. Yes, I printed it out. Oh, God. <laughs> Clive got really... He wasn't eating while he wrote this, but he got deeply poetic. He was facing mortality as he wrote this. Yep. Tom could read the signs. During the first two weeks, the body turned green and bloated, popping the buttons from Essex's shirt. Then, after internal fluids had expelled and evaporated, the corpse began to shrivel and dry out, the skin stiffen stiffening to the consistency, consistency of a tan hide. That is... Oh, you could feel that. Also, the eyeballs had sunk into the head at this point, too. So the eyes were gone. Yeah, they shriveled and they fell back. Oh, hooray! And in spite of that. <laughs> and also the languid voicing about how the smell is just permeating every aspect of the verb. Oh, yeah. Like the entire house. He steps in the front door and immediately smells putrefaction, which is wild. Like, oof, that's a rough house. But he sees that Essex is holding that little book. So Pitt, of course, picks the book up and sees that it is the Journal of Richard Essex from April 1914. And Pitt sits down and reads this book for an hour in the same room. Why doesn't he go to another room? <laughs> is this whole thing about... I know he's daddy issues with the senator. Is it just not, not enough self-love? There's no esteem? He, he just he's knows what's car. important. A beautiful book reading the car, Dirk. Ah, all I can think of is like... The book is going to smell like this forever, and there's a good chance he's going to smell like this for a while now, too. And if you get it in your nose hairs, your nose hairs are more like porous and bristly than any of the other hairs in your body, so it holds on to stench. And sometimes if, it's, if it smells really, really, really bad, you have to trim all of your nose hairs out. Or now I have to shave, thanks. With you. Ever you go. <laughs> I've heard this only connection with uh, the smell of rotting corpses. Anybody who's ever come across a rotting corpse will tell you at length. It's mandatory. You'll get all the details. I've only come across wild animal corpses, like deer, moose, bear, that kind of thing. Out in nature, they, they really don't smell that much because, you know, the birds and the bugs and everything will really keep that down. There was one, and this is actually a pretty mildly horrifying experience. I was, I was at a summer camp when I was a kid. I was at uh, the Alfred Lake Science Camp, which was just nature camp for science nerds. Just on the edge of the campground area, in between where all the buildings were and where all the kids slept, there was a bear trap. And it, it's not like the jaws that snap up. It was the bear trap that's just like a huge 55-gallon barrel on its side with a door that closes. And at some point while we were on that camp, a bear went in there and died. Wild Animal Service wouldn't come get it. So us kids were walking by this bear trap with a dead bear inside. And a big metal tin out in the sun is not what you want. Oh. Uh, that kind of... <laughs> we, oh. we we made a whole new trail to go around the other side of the campground to get from the teepees to, like, the mess hall. Wouldn't critters be going there? Oh, yeah, they were. But, How old were you? Uh, yeah, 12. Okay, so at least this wasn't your first camp. No, no, it wasn't my first camp. Being out at eight years old, seeing dead teddy bears stuck in the trap. But that was still messed up. It's still messed up, but it kind of was less traumatizing than, say, eight or seven. Yeah, true. But it is the right amount of traumatizing that you'll never forget it. So <laughs> I will never forget it. You still call me. It is more than three decades later, and boy, do I remember what that, that bear trap looked like. <sighs> and I like how you say, you know, that other kind of bear trap. No, I have no idea what the other kind of bear trap is. You, you get a very good ex explanation. 
you painted with words. I, I can visualize it now, but I didn't. <laughs> bear trap is just only the teeth on in the hinges, like the cartoon. This is the kind of bear trap that they use when they want to capture a bear and then like move it somewhere else. But they never came for the goddamn trap. The bear went in to get the food. The door closed. That was it. Nobody came and picked it up. So you have like a sous vide bear happening. <laughs> oh, that snow must have been just... That's also the worst thing you've ever said. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's get back to the book. And we've got a reference that I know. Dirksen, Fredericksburg, Virginia. The place of a Civil War battle that the Union lost terribly. They thought they were going in there. They were going to set off these explosives and create this big explosion and just go in. What they did was create a big ditch that they couldn't crawl out of, there, thereby giving <laughs> the Southerners the high ground. And it was just shooting people in a barrel. All of the Union soldiers fell into this crater and were just picked off. Damn. Very bloody. It wasn't the bloodiest battle, but it was gruesome. Yes. Pitt is here to meet with Joe Epstein, a reporter, but a reporter for the Baltimore Sun. This is absolutely a parlor scene. But it's more interesting than the other parlor scenes because we're outdoors and we're shooting muskets while we're doing it. Yes, it's sportive parlor scene. It's dynamic. This Joe Epstein guy is a, a rifleman, but not of the current type. He likes muskets? Yep, muzzle loaders. He wants to almost lose an eye every time he fires his gun. You have to have that sense of danger. You do. That's why they shouldn't inspect carnival rides. Pick it 50 50. You live or you die, <laughs> the kids will be so much more excited. But yeah, Dirk Pitt gave him the names of Essex and Shields and basically made Epstein do all the research for him. And Epstein comes back with basically the prologue of the of this book. Yes, he comes back with everything. Did they name drop the... Name drop? Uh, did they name the Empress of Ireland in the beginning of the book? I don't think or so. Or was it just a luxury ship? They only did that now. Yeah, that, that was only a luxury ship at the beginning. Okay, so... It was just called luxury ship. But Everest of Ireland is comes up here as as you said. He just goes over the prologue because Pitt's like, I need to know about Richard Essex and Harvey Shields. Richard Essex was the Under Secretary of State to Wilson. Harvey Shields was the British counterpart. And Essex uh, Essex dies on the train. Shields dies on dies on the Empress of Ireland, which was a real ship that went down May twenty eighth, nineteen fourteen. And I have notes here on it. It was a huge maritime disaster. Of the 1,477 people on board, 1,012 died. Woof. Most of the crew survived, and most of the dead were women and children, impoverished women and children from Ireland. It was double woof. It's like, well, that's you're an orphan, and you're finally getting cancer treatment. Go to America here, and it's and all all stories like that. It's, one heartbreaking story after another when you read the accounts of those who died. Save the important people. Ireland, never not depressing. When you think it's just surface level depressing, <laughs> they will surprise you. But like, no, no. There's more. It's way worse than you think. James Joyce is definitely a mood for uh, Ireland. <laughs> They've adopted it and taken it to heart. So the reporter tells him no bodies were recovered because Pitt inquires about that. He's like, well, what were the effects found on their person? Maybe the... Uh, obtaining object is in a cemetery or a evidence or and the guy's yep. like nope neither body ever recovered and essex and shields died on the same day spooky and not just neither of their bodies were recovered from the train accident no bodies were recovered and even the train was never found how that and i'm like i love you clive how do you where are you going with this how do you how do you disappear a train? Are you writing checks you can cash, Clive? There's a throwaway sentence that sometimes people report seeing the ghost train. So right off the bat, because I'm trying to think like these books uh, have taught me to think. So I'm, I'm imagining that the train oh, no. got off <laughs> on a be... siding before the bridge that was out. So the train never actually went in the river. The, the train just went off somewhere else. Ah. Which is my guess. That sounds That sounds likely. Yeah, because a whole train disappearing into the silt of the St. Lawrence River is not is not likely. The boat went down in the St. Lawrence River. The train went down in just like some river in New York. Oh yes, some bridge that's supposed to be in the Hudson Valley. And yeah, I looked up the bridge; it never existed. <laughs> makes sense. Real boat, fake train. It doesn't make sense. Half you know, real boat, fake train. Print the T-shirt. 
And I figured that's a good place to end because chapter 28 is a biggie. And that'll be uh, good to start the next episode with. I just want to tease a little bit. Clive Cussler discovers Rococo architecture. <laughs> and he likes it. He likes it. All right. Ending chapter 27. All right, everyone. Dirt Pit is on the case and doing stuff, kind of. Well, the next chapter is so much fun. Why can't we see? Not see you, listeners. <laughs> it really is. I have a lot of notes for that. <laughs> yes, listeners, either. I can't wait to talk to you next week, listeners. <laughs> we will see you next week. I can't wait for new mic. Can't wait. Whoa. This has been Custler Hustlers. Your hosts have been Topper and Nancy. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Custler Hustlers.